All right, let's get started. So hello, everybody. I'm, thanks, to everybody, for coming. My name is Justin Grody. I'm a Data Center Solutions Architect with Ally Digital. Today, we're going to be going through getting Visual Studio Code all optimized for PowerShell. So this is going to be sort of like an unplugged style session. What we're going to do is we're just going to take a fresh copy of VS Code, and we're just going to start adding stuff to it from all kinds of recommendations I have. And I'm just going to show you some tips and tricks, things I've picked up from working with Visual Studio Code for about the last five or six years. Um, I came from ISE, I love ISE, and it was a real hard shift for me to get over to Visual Studio Code, and I'll show a couple quick things about that, but the point is that this is not going to be an intro to Visual Studio Code. I'm not going to really go into any of that. This is more about, like, once you're there, but I'll provide you some resources for that. Uh, da -da, so real quick, a um, quick uh, plug for my company, Ally Digital, who graciously sponsored my travel. I uh, work for a company that is a large multinational MSP. We do all kinds of you know, IT management services, help desk services, uh, you know, global, global desk. We have around the sun services, all kinds of industry partnerships. Uh, you know, big company does all kinds of great things, but you know, has a really great culture, been around forever. If you're looking for a technology partner, highly recommend them. I work for them. They treat me great. So uh, check them out if you have any interest. And because I completely forgot to put my references um, on my last presentation, I blew right past the slide. I'm putting them right up front here. So um, here's some uh, references that you can have. These will all be in the GitHub and such. But up front, this is the, a presentation I did. Um, this first one here is a link to a YouTube video of a presentation I did for the RTP SUG that um, is uh, basically a version of this presentation from about two years ago. So a lot of this presentation is going to be about a lot of the new stuff, but check that out for a lot of some older stuff, um, settings, you know, not older, venerable settings that are still wonderful today. Uh, yeah, um, here, uh, if you want to get started, the PowerShell team has put together some great docs, um, just in the PowerShell repo docs like you have anywhere else, they have a great getting started. Um, Visual Studio Code has an ISE mode where the, um, they put a lot of work into it, and the extension is like ridiculously more complicated than it needs to be just to support a lot of the stuff to make it feel like ISE as much as possible. So that's a great article for getting that and kind of replicating that to help you kind of smooth the transition away from ISE because I don't know if you heard the news, but I, you know, ISE is no longer supported. It's just, it's just there. It's great. You know, continue to use it, but you know, this is the future. So if you want to take advantage of new features and be more productive and work on much larger things, you know, VS Code is going to be the way to go. And finally, I have a thing here. I'm not going to go into it, but as far as optimizing VS Code, Adam Driscoll. Adam, are you here? I don't think he is. You, you, um, Adam's here. Um, Adam runs a company called Iron Man Software. He makes an additional paid extension um, that adds all kinds of cool stuff, like refactors, EXEs, that kind of thing. I wanted to plug it here. He's not paying me, but it's really cool stuff. But I'm not going to cover it here because I don't want to. I want to keep it focused on the stuff you can get for free. But um, definitely check that out if you get if you want to get even further in those weeds. And that's it. All right. So here's what we're going to do. I have here on my desktop, and that is going to be super tiny. But don't worry about it. We're going to get there eventually. So first thing I'm going to do is just, I'm just going to open up and show you how to get, what the? <laughs> See, I knew, I did it last time. I closed all my things, and yeah, and all of a sudden, everything, everybody panics. I forgot to kill all my <laughs> notification stuff here. Wow. Yeah, so there, 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 that's my Twitter dashboard. So let's get all that out of there. Forgot to reset. So All right, so we're just going to go to Visual Studio Code, and I'm not even my demo guy. Off to a great start. So here we go, unplugged, real solid. All right, so again, Visual Studio Code. If you want to start, you know, here's how you start. Just Google it. There it is right up top. Click Download, and you can download, install, get started, get going. I assume most of you have probably done that. Have we ever installed Visual Studio Code at least once, maybe? Yeah, yeah, figure as much. Um, so but what we're going to do is we're going to do things a little bit differently. So one version of Visual Studio you can download is you can get it in a zip format. And so what that is is that because Visual Studio Code is just basically a, um, a, a Node.js application using Electron, um, it doesn't have, like, there's nothing like administer rights about it. So while they provide you an MSI to install to the system so it's easy for multiple users to use or images, it can run just out of a zip folder in the same way PowerShell. You can just download a zip of PowerShell and run it in from a folder anywhere you are. So I have that zip here, taking that zip and unzipped it to, this is a folder that I changed the icon, the super awesome PowerShell VS Code. And when I open this up, it's just a folder, and there's my VS Code. And actually, this folder doesn't exist. I'm going to delete it because we're going to recreate it. And I'm running VS Code, so I can't do that quite yet. But let me delete that guy back out of there. So here's a default folder. So VS Code has this really cool thing called a portable mode feature, where all you got to do is you download this zip, and then you just create this folder called data. 
just create a new folder and you name it data data. Now that's really small, but take my word for it in the back. Um, so when you do that, what Visual Studio Code will do is when it starts up, if it sees that folder, it will put everything about your Visual Studio uh, instance into that folder. So I have my current Visual Studio Code that has all my optimizations and everything down here. I run insiders. But this is now a portable version of VS Code that you put on a USB drive, you know, save as a zip and upload to OneDrive, and wherever you download it and run it, all your data is still in that folder. All your extensions, all your settings, where you've placed your windows, all your UI stuff, it's all portable in there. This is less important because the settings sync is so much better now, but this is also just good to know that you have an option. And it's really good for demos because you can have a fresh environment right here without having to do anything. So I'm gonna go ahead and open up Visual Studio Code. And I have here fresh environment, you know, whereas my, my Visual Studio Code's got all my customizations. This is what you see the first time anybody opens Visual Studio Code for the first time. I'll blow this up a little bit. Um, let me just, before I forget, turn on screencast mode so you can see what I'm doing here. So I'm just doing control minus and control plus. It's one of the built-in shortcuts. And if you don't believe me, the biggest shortcut you always want to know if you don't know it is if you're an old guy like me, control shift P. Otherwise, if you're a new person, F1, they bound that to it too. This thing is called the command palette. Um, who here has seen this before? Very aware of it in Visual Studio Code? Yeah, I figure because this is basically all you need to know. This is Google for VS Code. You go here and you can find everything you need to do in any command. So for instance, my zoom in and zoom out, there it is, and you can see there's the shortcut that maps to it. And so that's just, you know, eventually you learn these shortcuts, you can change them all, all that stuff as you know, and such. So we have ourselves a new Visual Studio Code, and so the first thing we wanna do is start getting extensions. And so we have lots of different options here, we get all kinds of good recommendations. Naturally, the first thing you're gonna wanna do is type PowerShell to get started. And so over here on the right, we got a good list of extensions here. And oh, great, these ones come up right away. So PowerShell, the venerable, it's great. You know, this is the one you're going to want. But there's another one, there's always a preview version. And at this point, um, the preview version is actually in a release candidate stage. So there's been this huge amount of work over about the last year, year and a half to rewrite how the internals of the PowerShell extension work to be more reliable, faster, allow for things to, like all kinds of certain IntelliSenses and stuff to work outside the main run space. So it's much more performant, much better. It's currently at a release candidate stage. Hopefully it'll come out you know, here pretty soon to promote stable. But at this point, I would strongly recommend right now to be running the preview version in most, like I use the preview version like every single day. And um, the, the, the maintainers of this um, currently, uh, of which I'm officially one of, but really like I contribute a couple little things, learn just enough C Sharp to be dangerous, and uh, I help out with the issues and such like that. But, um, They've been doing tons of great work on this. It's really available, and so I definitely recommend um, starting with the preview extension using it un until the new one goes stable. And then once it goes stable, it's available. And the nice thing is that one of the big things it's done is they've written a whole CI CD pipeline to generate all the code and everything like that. So if you haven't noticed, you've probably seen the release cadence of new releases is all the time. So like, in fact, if I go here, I got installed first, but I'll show that later. Um, one other thing, if we keep going down here, there's Pro Tools, because it's pretty popular, 138K downloads, for good reason, it's a great extension. And how far down do I have to get to me? So here I am, my, with my piddly 13K, the PowerShell extension pack. So what this is, this is a collection of extensions, and literally all it is is like, to make an extension pack in VS Code, all you do is basically take a JSON file and you put the names of the extensions in it, and then you publish it. Ta-da, you are now an extension author for VS Code. So that was my first extension. And so if I zoom, I'm gonna zoom this out just so you can see a little bit better in here. But basically the, an extension pack can contain all kinds of extensions. So I made this that, this is basically sort of your quick start, that you take this and you click that install and all 28 of these extensions will get in there and help you get started and get going. But if you don't want it, if you don't want everything that I have, you can still sort of curate and go through. Like, oh, you can pick and choose that one, take that one, take that one, nah, I don't really care about that, take that one. I need to remove this because um, the bracket pair colorizer is now part of VS Code, which is awesome. I'll show some of that in a minute. Um, but basically, here's your step two. So in two steps, you basically have everything that you need. Now we're gonna watch this happen on the Wi-Fi. This is probably gonna take forever, so we'll see how that goes. So while that's going, and we'll see how it, if it comes, I don't know if the pack, if it shows a status like it does the other ones for download. Well, we'll see, we'll see how it goes. In the meantime, we're gonna go through a couple different um, settings that you can add into VS Code that are really good for um, just the general editor. So one of the first ones that I like, and this, this, is, this kind of is like a small religious battle probably in VS Code, but one of the things I like to do is I like to take this thing, this pane on the right, and shift it to the other side. 
So if I can remember my shortcut for it. Uh, da, da, da. Is it panel right? No, it's not panel right. That's my terminal that's going there. See, I already forgot my shortcut for it. I, I have my setting for it. In fact, let's go ahead and open that while this is going on with its install. Where did you go? Here we go. I don't know. I wrote it. I'm not sure I trust it. One of the settings in here is you can disable that. Like, if, if it's code that you trust, you can disable that for, like, all your repos. Like, I have my projects folder where, like, if, if, if anything's in my projects folder, like, that's fine. Like, because that's the stuff that's all, like, my stuff managed. But it's a good thing to have on by default because there's a lot of stuff with extensions where things can load and execute by default that maybe you don't want. Okay, now we're starting to get some extensions showing up here. So get lens, all kinds of stuff. We'll go through those here in a minute. All these, getting all these nice warnings. Yeah, I know this isn't being maintained. I don't care. So with your settings, one thing you can do with your settings that's really nice is you can define this little colon PowerShell thing. And so, so first of all, also, if you go to the general settings, yeah, sorry. It's kind of tricky. I can't use my fancy new uh, shortcut because that's in my, my non-default install, but let me take this and bring that away. Able to move, there we go. So move primary sidebar right. I like to have this on the right side rather than the left side. And the main reason for that is that when I do these things in collapse, my code doesn't move back and forth. Like it just keeps it in the same place. So like if I'll just go ahead and move this back to the other side to show what I'm talking about. You know, like if, if you come from Visual Studio and that kind of thing, we're used to that, like, you know, like this doesn't bother you. But like this super bothers me. Like every time I'm going to something and I come back and my code and my code jumps back over, I'm like, I lose my focus. If you were in my PowerShell prompt customization, I talked a lot about like my philosophy for myself is just it's all about context. I like to have things like very contextual, very focused. And so this changes my context. My eye moves. I have to figure out where I was and, you know, if, when I was doing something else. So but just by moving this guy simply to the right, um, now, like, when I do this kind of stuff, my code stays in the same place. So that, that's a good first um, item to do. Um, so here's something that's new. This is new in about the last month or two is, again, I'm going to go to my, the magic Google of this. And here, there's this thing if I type, um, they renamed it on me. I can't remember what it's called. It used to be called side panel, but they got the, uh, they still call it side panel, they call it something else now. But again, I can Google it and see if I can find it. Where are you? Is it si no, sidebar, is that what they call it now? Secondary sidebar, now, what is this about? Okay, so secondary sidebar. So now, in VS Code, you have a second area to put stuff. And you can just drag anything you want over there. So the stuff that I like to put over there is you can take like a whole category, you can take your source control, and now all your Git stuff is over on this side, and you can collapse that and reopen it as you need to. And if you want to bind, you can bind a shortcut to that, like I bind like control shift slash, so that I can just pop that open and close it. So what I like to have over here, I don't, I like to have my source control over here. I generally have all my file management stuff over here, but then I like to put all my like testing and navigation stuff on the other side. So you don't just have to move bit full things, like I can take the outline here and stretch that out and put that over here, and now I have my nice kind of like, you know, like if you're a Visual Studio code, Visual Studio person, you're kind of used to having it like this. And so that, great, I got that. But then I can take like my testing. So for instance, I like to have my, I haven't done my configs here, but like if I have my configs here, like my breakpoints, I can drag my breakpoints over there. So when I'm, and I then I'll show um, a pester test extension that I wrote so that I can have on my right side is like my file navigation and on my left side is all my tests. So like when I'm editing my tests, working with them, I have them all available there right on the left hand side to go through, click, run, et cetera. So this side panel is a really nice new feature um, that really helps with a lot of different kinds of development, not just PowerShell, but it's really helpful to be able to put all these items in that area. Another neat new thing you can do is, if I close that guy out, and of course this guy went big on me, split, go away. Um, so you don't just have to have your terminal at the bottom, you can have it on the side. So if I move my, I think I can move my activity bar. Oh, that's an old command. Forget I did that. Uh, where do you go? Somewhere. Can't remember if you can just grab this guy or not, or just kill it. So. So one of the things you can do now is in addition to having your terminal, you know, left, right, or bottom, you can take any terminal that you have and tear it off and put it into your editor window. And now you have it as another editor just like you would a tab. So this is really useful, especially if you split window, you know, rather than have it at the bottom, you can, and you can split it all kinds of different ways, however you want to have those. 
that you can, when you, you know, have some code and run it on the left-hand side, now you can watch it happen in real time there, but have like a long view of it so you can watch like more detailed activity that occurs there. So that's another like really handy thing to have there. I'm just gonna do my reset view. Okay, so that's just sort of the layout of the different ways you can lay out with VS Code that are fairly new. So let's go into some of these extensions that have come down. So you see I got a whole bunch of extra new stuff here. And I wanna talk about a couple ones in particular that are great. So the first one that I wanna do is I'm gonna go ahead and just open a repository I have. We'll just go ahead and go with the VS Code PowerShell extension. Actually, let's see, I think I have cones in here. I don't, let's, how about one of my other random ones? Uh, how about secret management key pass? Let's see how that looks these days. Yes, I trust the author. I am the author. Thank you very much. And so there's all kinds of stuff you got to sign into. Oh, so one thing I forgot to start with too is um, if you who here is using the settings sync in VS Code? Okay, not as many as I would think. So if you haven't ever used the settings sync, it's fantastic. It's basically a backup of all your settings. It's built into VS Code. It used to be a separate extension. Now it's built in. And all you have to do is you go in here. You choose an account to log into. You can use a GitHub account or a Microsoft account. And when you turn on Settings Sync, it'll go through and you just sign in and turn on and it will synchronize all your settings out to this little storage bucket. It's free, it doesn't cost you anything. You can be tied to either your GitHub account or your Microsoft account. And now everywhere you sign into your GitHub, just like you kind of have with like Microsoft Edge, all your settings, extensions, everything will come with you. So your side panel will be that. If you work in different environments, you know, if you need to, you know, work on like a company laptop, that kind of thing, it can synchronize all that, and more importantly, backs it up. You know, if this computer take it, go throw it, you know, go throw it and break it in half, do I want to go through and set all these up and all these little settings and figure out where I was, or do I just want to start a new version of VS Code, sign in, and suddenly my whole environment's exactly as I remembered, all my tunes, tweaks, my custom shortcuts, et cetera. It syncs all these things, and you can choose what to sync, you can choose to exclude certain things you don't want to sync, any, any setting, like, you know, settings that are maybe like environment specific, like a path to an executable or something, you can selectively choose not to sync that. Um, highly recommend it. Definitely, like, this is the first thing I turn on every time I do it. I'm not gonna turn it on right now because it's gonna flip everything over to my other environment, but uh, you get the idea for that. So, um, I'm here in a Git repository, and I have kind of your typical Git stuff that you're used to down here. There's an extra little button here called Git Graph. So this is an extension, Git Graph, that um, if you're, you know, I'm comfortable with the git command line tool. I've done a lot of work getting with git checkout, that kind of thing. But there's times like, when, again, when I talk about context, like just staring at that command prompt, I'm like, where am I? Like, what branch am I in? Like, where, how does this branch relate to what I was working on? And I'm like 12 commits deep. Did somebody else do something that doesn't tie in? How am I supposed to merge that to something else? And so there's two, you know, you can figure that out with the git graph command line and the text interface and such. And there's uh, other third party things like Git Kraken and GitHub Desktop, which give you kind of good views. But again, context, if I can keep everything in VS Code, if I don't have to context switch to some other program to come back, I'm much more likely to stay in the zone of what I'm working on. So if I click this Git Graph, I get this really nice view of my entire repository. And, and I can see what branch I'm on, other branches that are going on, and the status of where everything is. So, you know, I have my fix of, of secret management. We'll go and just do a new branch here. And so now there's my new branch. And if I want to go here and take something and we're just going to take my build and say, save it. Oh, how do I know? Oh, gee, I haven't updated this to 7.3.2.3 yet. We'll worry about that later. Do I want to install the recommended extension for PowerShell? I'm pretty sure I already did. So we'll save that, you know, I've got a config change, I got all this stuff that I've been changing, we'll just take this and say, here's some new stuff. And we'll leave Git Graph over here, save it, commit, yeah, I want to stage, I get it, I'm doing all kinds of crazy stuff. And there, in real time, it updates and shows me, okay, here's my branch, it's now updated, there's the time, that person made the change. If I had another colleague that was working and I pulled some changes, I could refresh and then see what they changed. Here's a pull request that this very nice person who I probably sat on way too long to merge left for me. And, uh, you know, and this is all filterable, so you can go, if you just wanna see the status of an individual branch or relationship of a couple branches, again, for context, to cut down noise. Sorry, I should minimize some of this stuff so it's more visible. 
um, you know, really powerful. You know, if you only want to see certain remote branches, if you only want to see what you're locally working on, like this is a really powerful extension if you're the kind of person like me who like, if you're very visual and you want to see how the, your Git works and where you are and how things are related. And this is super helpful, especially when you're doing things like rebase or other things that are going to potentially destroy things. Making sure you know where you are and what you're doing, highly useful, highly. And one other thing too is that this is not just a view only tool. You can right click here and you can rename branches, you can push branches, you can check out, cherry pick, merge to a branch, you can initiate a rebase. Uh, the rebase will have a visual version so that you can make sure you can check and put, and put the commits where you want them to be. Um, it's tools like this that have made me so comfortable with Git that I, like, I don't worry about where my files are going and such like that. I mean, when I first started with Git, like the first time you do a Git branch and all your files disappear or something like that on your file system, you're like, oh shit, what did I do? What happened? Where did everything go? Uh, you know, do, having tools like this really brings me into my comfort zone with tools like Git so that, like, I, I don't even worry now, like, when I do a new branch or I do over here, like, because I see what's happening and I can see what's going on, I can feel safe that my files are backed up, that if I go and make this change, I can revert it and feel safe. Really helpful in that regard. So let's move on to another extension. So one aspect um, in addition to that is a great tool called Git Lens. And so this is all specific to Git. I know I'm not really talking about PowerShell, but if you really get serious about PowerShell and you want to really have like an environment that fosters PowerShell, you, you treat it like any other programming language. And so you have revision control. You tie it to pipelines. You tie it to deployment systems. And Git is just a great place that like when you're writing a script, if you have a large script and you make some small change and then you hit save, and it's like, wait, what did I change? Or it's not running. I didn't realize I accidentally like fat fingered a key or my dog came and ran over the keyboard at the same time. Uh, you know, Git is just a great tool for that. And so that's why I'm talking a lot about Git. And so it has all these nice things like these little statuses of like, hey, who put this stupid line in here? For instance, hey, I hope you find this. Hey, you did this stupid three minutes ago. And then you can get all the details. You can see that change, look at the details, do all kinds of fun stuff there. You know, really what it does is it gives you all those nice guardrails around Git so you don't just have to work with the command line. And there's nothing wrong with the command line. It works great, but if you're in an editor, you know, the nice thing here is having those contexts and that help there. So the next one I want to go to, again, as we talk about context, is an extension called Error Lens. So Error Lens is this great extension where if I have some code here, and like, for instance, my build here, let's say I leave off a quote. Typically, what you see here is that you have your little problems down here. It's like, oh, okay. Something's missing here. I'm missing a string terminator. Some things are kind of, you know, not right in this code. If I put this guy back, then we're good there. We'll do like a better example by like dropping off a bracket here or something. Okay. So what happens is when you have error lens installed, you notice that not only do I have my messages down here, it lets me know right where the error is detected where my problem is. And it does it in real time. So like if I'm going and I fat finger something, I immediately know, oh, wait, I messed that up. And this is huge, like another big thing about my philosophy, and it's a common development philosophy, is a thing of like called shortening your development loop in terms of when you want to test something, you want to be able to get your feedback as fast as possible so you can figure out and fix it. I'll give you the best example of this. Who's ever written a GitHub Actions or Azure DevOps pipeline? Who's ever done commit hell where you're like, please work, let's try this, let's see how that works, let's see if that happens, and the time in between each time you do that is 20 minutes. That's an example of a terrible development loop because you're not getting fast feedback about what your problem is. And so this is just another way to shorten that. And so the more you can bring fast feedback into what you're doing, that you know, helps you really be able to develop and get your stuff out quicker, be more productive in PowerShell, and just write better, cleaner code. So let's go into um, a couple settings here. Um, why are these not expanding those? Oh, it's because I deleted everything because I went to this branch. But thankfully, that's what we have Git for. And we'll just go back into uh, this guy here and get all our stuff back. So next thing we will do is I have just kind of a list of things here. We'll go ahead and get out of key pass, and we'll just do a new window. And let's go ahead and open another one. We'll just go to the sandbox. Where's my sandbox? There he is. Let's just pick something at random. Let's do a power config demo for fun. So I have my terminal down here. I'm ignoring my releases because I'm a bad person. And by the way, you'll notice my prompt is different. This is just something that's part of my system. If you came to my um, the the configuring your PowerShell prompt, that's all about that. 
not going to go into it too much right now, but you'll be able to look at it there. So you'll see like, but there's like some characters here that don't quite work. So one thing that's really nice is that there's these fonts that you can install called nerd fonts. Um, and, you know, and you can use any font, but basically these nerd fonts, what they've done is they've taken a collection of a lot of the common fonts, and they've taken all these extra symbols. So just like, you know, just like A, B, C, D, E, F, G are all just code points and symbols in the code. Well, there's, there's room in Unicode for all this other symbols that, you know, usually don't get used. So what they do is they take all these different symbols from all these different icon packs and basically fill them in to where all those different symbols are. So what you have is you now have a font without using emojis that um, can represent all these things. Like you can have a symbol for like what a git branch looks like. And so if you install that, then you can have um, uh, different aspects of the font. So I don't think I have a good way to add the setting here, so I'll just show it from my main VS Code here. So if I bring up my terminal in here, we'll blow it up a bit. This one uses that nerd font. I use one called um, uh, Delugia Code, which is a version of Cascadia Code, which is the default Windows terminal font. And so you see that character that before had a question mark is this nice little like rounded, I know that probably doesn't come up very well in the projector, but you can see there's this nice little like rounded icon there. And so it's, again, it's just a nice little thing to have these things. And what it also gets you in your editor is it gets you these neat things called ligatures. So you know, for instance, if you do not equal, notice it changed it to this kind of funky symbol. But it's still text, so like when you go to save this, it doesn't save like some crazy character. It's still not equals, but a ligature just makes it so that, hey, we're gonna represent this particular combination of characters with some special kind of character. And like, that's a little like weird at first, but you come to find like it's really useful because especially when you're like writing code, you start seeing these symbols that let you know like, okay, I'm, I'm trying to do this one thing as opposed to like a not equals, you know, you just get used to seeing this, this symbol. And so like that, you know, that's a better representation of, you know, not equals versus a bang and an exclamation mark. And so as you get used to them, they're really helpful. So definitely install like a ligature based font. Those are, those are very helpful for um, having that. Or don't, like again, that's, that's kind of a personal preference thing, but I really like that aspect because you have all these additional symbols. And if I go into a place like, you know, projects, and if I go to a, a branch, it doesn't hang up on me. If I go to VS Code PowerShell, You'll see like, so like that symbol right there, that's just a character like any, oops, yeah, I'm breaking the rules, I'm not supposed to do that. Uh, this character right here, that's just a, a character in the uh, font set now. So it's a, simply an aspect of like, it's able to just represent it like an X or a Y or any other kind of character. And so you're gonna get, can have that kind of contextual stuff and make all your prompts as well as have your code have those. So nerd fonts are great for representing that kind of information. All right, so we will go on to our next extension of the day. Uh, da -da -da, wait, wait, these are not, are these my installed ones? These are not my installed ones. Let's go to installed. Okay, so better align. I like this one a lot. So one thing we do a lot of is work with hash tables. And what better align can do is it can take any kind of code that you have, you know, where things are like not aligned, that kind of thing, and just very intelligently, control shift P, align, and it'll figure it out. Notice it also aligns it on the right-hand side of the brackets, too. So that's great with splatting. It's great with any kind of thing where you have a lot of code lined up like that. Large JSON files. Um, you know, I'll, I'll take a, I think I have my settings JSON as an example I can show. It's a little example. I, I cherry-picked a few settings that I was gonna go through when we have time. Yeah. Yeah, so I'll, I'll get to the, the, the format document aspect, but th what's nice about this is it works anywhere. It doesn't just work in PowerShell. So like if I have something like this, I can take all this stuff, control shift P align, boom, there's my JSON in a really nice aligned format. So, so yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll get into the formatting aspect here in just a minute. In fact, what I just aligned was all my code, code formatting settings. So thank you for the segue. So that's one way to do it. Another way to do it is that PowerShell has its own built-in code formatting. So if I go ahead and open my settings here, open settings for JSON, and we'll just take some of these uh, settings over. And, and by the way, all the changes that I make, they all show up here. So that workbench sidebar location, like this is the setting that moves this thing over here. I change it over to left and hit save, immediately moves it. But I like it, on, and, and again, there's that error lens. Let's see, like how nice is that? Like as soon as you make a screw up, hey idiot, that's not a right value, you know? It becomes much easier than having to look down in the problems pane and figure out what's going on. So then we'll go, let's put these guys side by side. Split layer right. Again, not 
my normal one, so I go, that should still be like reasonably legible. So we have all these different code formatting settings that we can do in PowerShell. So a couple of them I like, first ones that exist, which are prior to that aspect of it is, do I have them further down, where did they go? I think they're in the editor settings, way down here. Okay, editor. So there's a few of these that you can set that allow, you know, because you can do the control shift P format document, but like that's kind of annoying. What if you forget? Like what if you're trying to enforce kind of a code standard? There's ways you can do this so that it just does it automatically. So you can do it so every time you paste code in, like you're pasting something in from Stack Overflow, you say, hey, when I paste some PowerShell code, just go ahead and format it for me. Like if it has aliases like percent in question, expand those out to where object, you know, that kind of a thing. So if we take those settings here, we'll copy those and bring them over into our happy land. Those are some good ones to have, great. And then, so a couple of these are just, for instance, I want to suggest some selections, I want to format on save, and what I also want to do is this nice setting of format on save modification. This is awesome if you're working in like with, if you're doing like pull request contributions or you're working in somebody else's code base. Is like you don't want to like make two line change and then have the formatter reformat the entire script and now your PR is this giant, you know, PR even though you only changed two lines. What that lets you do is that'll take it so that it'll just look at the lines that you modified based on the git control and then go ahead and only format those lines. So like, so you can still write in your shorthand, like if you want to write your, your uh, pull request and you want to do, you know, you know, git item pipe percent to simulate for each and then pipe question mark to do where object. As soon as you hit save, it'll still expand out all those aliases for you, but only for that line of code. So that when you go to submit your PR, it's still nice and tight and easy to, easy to review for the poor person who has to review your PR. And so back up here again, so these are all the nice formatting settings that exist for that. You have, um, you can align property value pairs. That's the one that uh, I showed, you know, that's the align version that's built into PowerShell, where if you turn that on, then when you build a hash table and you format the document and you paste it, or when you hit save, if you have format on save, it'll go through and make that look all really nice, as opposed to being like all misaligned with equal signs and such. Autocorrect aliases, very good one if you work in just kind of like a general, if you work in a team. Um, I love this one because I love to write in the shorthand, like write up, you know, all my, you know, I'll do things like just do like, you know, like SSE for select string, I'll do just all the little shorthand aliases, I have a ton of aliases in my profile, so I can write my, power, a lot of people complain, like PowerShell is so verbose, I gotta do all this typing, it doesn't have to be, you know, you can make all kinds of little aliases and write as fast as you want, and write as pithy as, as you want, for all kinds of environments. And you can use a question mark instead of writing out where object, you can use a percent sign instead of writing out for each object, um, but the nice thing about that is like, I can write that, but I send that to somebody and it looks like a bunch of co code golf junk. So if you enable the autocorrect aliases, I can write that. In fact, I'll go, go ahead and we'll take these settings and bring them over. And let's just show what that looks like, hopefully. Uh, didn't set my default language to PowerShell, so we'll do that. Do I have my ISC? He's running good, great. So, you know, get content where name is this for each, you know, hi. So it's giving me all these warnings, you know, it's like, okay, this is an alias, you probably shouldn't do that. I'm gonna go ahead and format it. Oh, it's like I haven't saved it to a document yet, desktop. Super rad demo that will definitely work. <laughs> I believe in positive affirmation. And it doesn't want to work, so that's the way it is. I probably don't have, like, I got my settings in there, right? Is this the right one? I'm ch <laughs> uh, It's there, it's there to do. Save, here's what we're gonna do. It's like, it's like the oven, let's go back to my one that I know works. Do my new PowerShell, and we'll do git gc name equal. Actually, even better. I got a better way to do this. Just uh, get this guy. Get my C's up. Or that. See if we can get our copy paste to work. So we'll copy that. Paste it. Oh, I didn't recognize it. Wrong window. Try again. There we go. Ta da! First try. Every try. So that was an example of the paste on format. So again, I have all these aliases in there, but as soon as I paste, formats it all, expands everything out, don't have to worry about it. Uh, that's built into the PowerShell extension. So that's just simply a matter of setting these settings. So I probably should, real, again, I'm not trying not to go too much on just like the, 
super basics, but if you go into the, um, if you open just your normal settings, like we'll do like the settings JSON, any one of these, if you do, if you start typing and you do PowerShell, you start getting all the different settings that you can tune and tweak. And there's a GUI for this too, if you hit this little flip button, okay, here we go, now we can go to extensions, we can go down here to PowerShell, and all these things that you can figure, like do you, you know, how do you want your braces? Do you want your braces on the same line? Do you want them on a new line? You know, do you want to pretend like you're a C-sharp developer? You know, you can lay, lay out however you want the, uh, whatever your code format is. And the nice thing is like a lot of these settings you can actually put into a file inside your repo. It's called a workspace setting, and then that'll enforce it for everybody in your team so that when you go to format document, if, if they're writing it and they put the brace on the new line, when they hit format on save, it'll just move that brace to a new line that matches your code standard. It's, it's, not, it's a good sort of like first gate. You really should be using like a GitHub action that does like script analyzer to fix that stuff. But it's kind of a nice like, like initial thing, especially for like PRs. So, like if you're trying to enforce a certain kind of code standard, it's a nice sort of like not, not like strictly enforced but easy way to kind of like, you know, just get everybody on the team like, hey, use these settings or just use the workspace settings and there we go. How are we doing? We've got some good time here. All right, so we have, um, so, so that formatting is really useful and, you know, again, unless you write chicken scratch like I usually write, but then in the end result get like a nice full blown out setup. Okay, back to our terribly working, non-working that I don't know why that is, but we'll, we can probably figure it out. I probably just missed some setting somewhere to enable. You know what I probably did is I probably just didn't enable code formatting or something, but. Uh, I got two windows now, don't I? Yeah. Okay, so let's close that out. Don't need to see that. So some other kind of settings that are really helpful. Um, one thing I want to show, which a lot of people don't know you can do, is um, who has used like launch configurations for debugging? You know, you get the little debugging on the right. So one thing that a lot of people don't know you can do is there's this new special thing you can put in the settings where you can have this launch heading. And you can define debug settings that are for your VS Code instance, not for everything. So if you define this, like I'll have this all available in the GitHub, but you can define this and you have PS Interactive, you know, run, like I like them, you know, be able to run with arguments, uh, run my pester tests, do an attach, all that kind of stuff. Rather than, usually if you're doing PowerShell things, you probably know every time you do a new project, you gotta go click and make that new launch JSON, all that kind of stuff. This is a way to have them globally. So if I go back to my, again, one I know works, as long as I'm in any repo, which I'm not, apparently, uh, let's just go open something random. You know, we'll see what's in our good project that I have. Let's go with, uh, uh, no, let's go with mortar. I haven't touched mortar in a while. So here I am in a PowerShell thing, like it has some config, you know, it, but it, you notice it doesn't have a .vs code in here, you know, but if I go to my run and debug, hey look, I've got all my run and debug tasks available even though I haven't defined any in the workspace because you can now define them in your user settings. And so you can have your kind of typical ones that you use. This is great for, again, great for PRs, like if you're working in somebody else's environment or you're working on an open source project, they might have defined tasks that like, eh, maybe aren't your speed, maybe aren't your tempo and you just wanna have your, your typical PS interactive that you like, that you run and you do things and you do a, you know, you set your error action to break. And I go, oh no. And then there's my debug, but see, it ran the debug and I didn't have to make a task JSON for that, I didn't have to make a launch JSON, it's built in. So all you gotta do is simply just, you basically just use that launch keyword and then you just define them the same way as you would in a launch JSON. So super helpful, really handy to be able to have just all your typical PowerShell things that you do, you know, but it's tied to your profile. And again, with setting sync, now that floats to any VS Code you use. If you go out to run it in code spaces, if you do it in a dev container, you've got them there. Uh, okay, to do, what else do we wanna go here? Um, I like this setting, this is kind of a nice one, this is a fairly new one. You can now set a limit in tabs, so that if you take this, and uh, will you go ahead and throw that in here? So now if I go and I just keep creating tabs here, it'll max out on the number of tabs that show. Because I have a real bad problem. Like I, I am I'm a real bad problem of not closing tabs. So I'll get done with the VS Code session, I'll have like 15 tabs in my VS Code. I'm like, oh, what do we need to close? So what this does is this basically handles it for me. It's just whatever the most recent things that I've done, it just keeps those. And it works with opening files in the browser too. So if you click here, you notice it never goes above three or four files. It's just kind of keeping it here. And if I do a new thing, Oops, if I do a new thing, it'll just go ahead and just keep rolling it forward. So that old one dropped off and now I got that there. So real, real easy way to like help yourself stay organized again, help remove some of the clutter, a nice new feature in uh, VS Code. 
All right, we're at five minutes, so I promised I'd show VS Code Pets. So we'll do that. Pets for your VS Code. We will install him, and there he is, our happy little boy. That this this is absolutely the most productive thing you can do with your VS Code. Like you will, it it you have to understand because you have to understand like programming is as much about mental health as it is productivity and physical health. So sometimes you just need a little companion to help out. And if I go ahead and oh, where's my pet? Reset. Send additional pets to a farm. Spawn me a pet. And like, oh, look at my little kitty. He's there. He's going to go around. Oh, he goes, oh, he swiped. Oh, he's, he doesn't like my, doesn't like my mouse. Oh, he's so cute. He come. Here you go, buddy. Yeah, how you doing? You're good. All right, I'm bored with you. Uh, spawn an additional pet. Uh, who do I want? Cat? Really? Here we go. Uh, we got to save that to the end. How about, how about, how about a better version of Clippy? Zappy. Oh, there he is. Oh, he's cold. He's getting a cold start. He's freezing up. So yeah, this is, this is like a goofy extension, but to show you the power of extensions, you can have anything to like run a VS Code pet, anything like that. And there he goes back and forth, doing his thing. So then, of course, all right, by popular demand, we'll spawn Clippy. But even better, what color Clippy? Mm. Obviously yellow. Oh, now they're starting to make friends. And they're all hanging out. Man, we are good. Uh, let's see, wait, when, when was that project deadline? Doesn't matter. We're, we got, we got, hey, look, there he is. Check out his hat. Oh, he loves me. Oh, Clip, he's so sweet. You know what? I just want to have you around forever. Hey, I got that cool new sidebar. You know, let's go ahead and take you. And I can't throw him there, but I can bring him over here. That's good. I got you there. I want you maybe have you as a little pal. Sneaking his way. So, so clearly the most productive extension you can have in VS Code. Get him. Get him. Uh, that's, that's, just the, that's just the rest. This is what I need 90 minutes for, is just let that run. Like, that, that's easy content right there. Yeah. Oh, by the way, con continuing the in-joke from my, uh, pro pro I'm never going to, it's going to take me three months to remember. Like, fine, I'll fix it. I'll fix it. <laughs> if you're at my PowerShell prompt customization, that's a continuation of an inside joke. Uh, okay, I think one more thing. Let's see, I got two minutes. I could probably real quickly, like, who's here seen my pester test extension at all? That's pretty good. So this is a little thing of, that I made a project that I just kind of want to do, get into. We'll just go back to kind of my main run space here, zoom this out. Let's see, let's see, go ahead and open it. What's a project that I've used it recently on? Uh, let's see, uh, how about, it might work with press. We'll just try key pass, it might still work. Probably not, but we'll find out. So I open my side panel here. Am I, oh, I'm in the wrong VS Code, that's why. Let's try Mortar, side panel. I don't think Mortar has any tests, but. Yeah, it doesn't have any tests. Bad example. So I made an extension that basically lets you, again, that whole thing of context and lowering your development cycle, being able to have them just right here in your console to be able to run your pester tests with. I just can't remember what's here. Let's do big date modified. Maybe that'll help me out to find something that I worked on recently. That does not help me. Test job, that's a good one. Uh, does he have tests? He does not have tests, fine. How about exchange rest? That's got a, a couple, I think. Uh, all my various projects. Posh and Maps got some tests. I think it'll work for there. Let's find out. Side panel, make sure that comes up and have my pester test extension running. Did it move on me? This is a great demo end. Just bang a little bit whimper. Oh, here's how we do this. Check this out. There's this website. I don't know the URLs for my own stuff, so. Oh, there it was. I saw it. I saw it. There we go. So I made this extension that uh, what it lets you do is all your pester tests will show up on the uh, right-hand side over here, or where, wherever you want to. You can move this wherever you want. So your whole pester test hierarchy shows up here in VS Code. And when you run it, it does it in a high-performance, real-time way. You can run it, and you get to watch your test go and step through. And if you have issues with it, it integrates directly with the new VS Code testing API they added. So for instance, if you had an exception, you get this nice little pop-up. 
that up. You get this nice little pop-up that shows, you know, hey, an exception, this is what you were expecting, but this is what actually happened. And so it completely integrates with your pester test. Really great way to get started with pester. Every time you save, it can run your pester test. Again, great way to shorten that development loop rather than having to run invoke pester over and over again. So I hope that was helpful. I know the, the goal of this was just go till we ran out. There's tons more tips. I'm going to have all those out on the GitHub, all my configs that I didn't get to and little notes. And then there's those video presentations. So thanks very much.